Last spring, college students at several University of California and Cal State campuses set up encampments and rallied against Israel's war in Gaza. This fall, both UC and CSU are revamping their protest rules with a harder line on encampments, barriers, and under some circumstances, whether protesters can wear face masks. Here's Dilsey Perez, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs at California State University, presenting the new policy at a recent Board of Trustees meeting. Our role in interpreting and following these standards is to strike a balance where we can provide ample opportunities for free speech, remain committed to our educational mission, and ensure campus safety. Most importantly, we must do this in a content and viewpoint neutral manner. The new policies around protests are sparking criticism from some students and faculty who say the new restrictions could limit free speech rights. Here's Cal State Long Beach student Luis Ortiz speaking at the trustees meeting. There have been several protests and demonstrations on the Cal State Long Beach campus, but we're not hit with these TPM violations until we speak about the babies being killed in Palestine. Free speech is only allowed if President Connolly allows it. Free speech is only allowed if, if Chancellor Garcia likes it. This is Education Beat, getting to the heart of California schools. I'm Zadie Stavely. This week, California universities get tough on student protests and encampments. My colleagues, Amy DePiro and Michael Burke, have been covering UC and CSU's changes in protest policies. Amy's here today to discuss the changes. Hi, Amy. Hi. So can you describe the new policies CSU and UC have put in place this fall? And what are the changes here? Yeah, so um, this fall, both Cal State and the University of California have essentially revisited what are called time, place, and manner policies on their campuses. These are the rules that govern how students and faculty and anybody else on a college campus can gather. Um, Basically, they're the rules that often impact protest. So at both Cal State and UC, we see them heading in a similar direction. Both the UC and and CSU have made clear that they're banning encampments of any kind. These are kind of overnight protests and demonstrations. The UC President Drake, for example, has instructed UC chancellors to clarify those policies and make clear that setting up a camp, a tent or temporary housing isn't allowed without getting prior approval. Both UC and Cal State have banned unauthorized structures. These are things like platforms or benches or moving you know, building materials such as pallets or building barricades. They're placing some restrictions on when people can mask. Basically, what they're saying is that it's not as if you're banned from wearing a face mask at all. You're you're perfectly allowed to wear a face mask if you're sick or otherwise complying with university policies. But what um, these time, place and manner restrictions are saying is that if you're otherwise breaking a rule, let's say that you've thrown a, a boulder through a window and you're wearing a mask in order to conceal that it's you who's throwing that boulder, then, you know, that would be an occasion where the fact of wearing a mask to conceal your identity would be in violation of this policy. And then similarly, you know, both universities have made it clear that they're wanting to prevent any kind of restriction of free movement on their campuses. So in other words, you you can't, you know, have a protest in such a way that it's blocking streets or walkways or, you know, any kind of pedestrian or vehicle path on campus. And in September, the UC Regents approved requests from UC campus police departments to take an inventory of basically military style weapons and ammunition. And they've approved requests for there to be more of those weapons. And it's important to note here, some of these rules are new, but some of them are not. Uh, Cal State, for example, has been quick to note 
that what they've done is compile rules that have been on the books oftentimes for quite a long time, but put those policies all in one place and then kind of repackage them and make sure that students and faculty and everybody else are aware of what the rules are and how they will be enforced and the consequences of breaking them. So even though the policies might have been in place, I think the response may not have been in line with those policies. So how did the universities respond to things like encampments in the past? You know, I think last spring, depending on the campus, depending on the scale and type of protest that was happening, um, university presidents at UC and CSU reacted very differently. So I can tell you that at San Francisco State, there was an encampment that university administrators and faculty visited quite frequently that, you know, students were camping overnight and then during the day holding teach-ins or workshops or other kinds of events to bring attention to what was going on in Gaza. There was not, you know, a strong intervention to have those encampments, um, you know, removed immediately. And then administrators basically negotiated to, to have those encampments taken down. We saw different things play out on different campuses, though. So at UCLA's campus, again, there was a student encampment, but it took a turn for the worse. There were counter protesters who came one night and there was a confrontation between uh, these counter protesters and the students in the encampment. And um, really, UCLA received really harsh criticism for not intervening to prevent counter protesters from, you know, harming students who were in this encampment or otherwise maybe just managing the crowd better. And so, you know, I think that as a result of an incident like that, uh, there's been pressure on both university systems to prevent instances of violence in the future. And so I think that this is an open question about how will they react, you know, should students again start pitching tents in quads. It's still early days and, I, and I'm not exactly sure how individual campuses will enforce these restrictions. Why are the universities making these changes? You said there's been pressure on them. Where was that pressure coming from? All of this has been driven by a kind of reaction to protests on campus during the spring and um, really state legislators going to the universities and requiring them to make people aware of what protest policies are and report back about what they're doing to respond to protests and to, you know, make sure that, that free speech guidelines are known on their campuses. As part of this year's budget agreement. Uh, Lawmakers basically inserted language directed to both CSU and to UC. As part of that, they withheld $25 million from UC until its president submitted a report to the legislature. And free speech and civil rights groups have also criticized how the universities responded to protests, right? Yeah. So an attorney for the ACLU wrote a letter to Cal State Long Beach basically pushing back on a warning that some faculty members had received following some protests that they participated in last spring. These Long Beach faculty members had been using some form of sound amplification. And, you know, it turns out that per university policies, if you've got a microphone or a loudspeaker or a bullhorn that you're using, there are restrictions on when you can and when you can't use sound amplification. And so the warning that these faculty members received was basically like, uh, you know, kind of putting them on, on notice. Hey, like, these are the rules on our campus. And so the ACLU was saying, hey, when you have free speech regulations, they have to be narrowly tailored. From his perspective, the restrictions at this campus did not seem to be narrowly tailored. Over at UC Santa Cruz, a group of civil rights groups, including the ACLU, basically sued uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz, saying that the campus unlawfully banned students and faculty from campus um, after they participated in pro-Palestinian protests. That lawsuit says that campus officials violated the law by not providing those people with a hearing before they were banned. How have students and faculty responded to these changes? This issue has really touched a nerve. You know, I think that the the most vocal commenters at 
this last meeting of the Cal State Board of Trustees were people who were basically saying that they feel that these policies are too restrictive, that they worry that if they were enforced rigorously, they would put a chill on on, uh, free speech and assembly on campus. You know, for example, I think some commenters were saying that they had questions and concerns about rules around flyers or banners or things of this nature. Others pointed to the restrictions around masking as something that was causing them concern. And and I think, you know, probably two faculty members compared the policies to restrictive speech policies in, in other countries. One thing that's a theme, particularly among faculty members, is a feeling that they didn't have an opportunity to weigh in on the interim guidance that's been released. Here is CSU San Marcos professor Sharon Elise speaking at the CSU Board of Trustees meeting when the new rules were announced. The changes proposed in the time, place, and manner policy restrict rights enshrined centuries ago in the Constitution and reaffirmed decades ago in the Berkeley free speech movement. Now faculty and students are threatened with disciplinary action if they raise their voices in protest. Yet it was this very thing, raising our voices, sometimes with amplification, to protest wrongs in the world that brought positive change for marginalized and oppressed people. We rejected unjust laws and systems with our nonviolent civil disobedience. As students, we built shanty towns and protested apartheid to topple that system, and those protests were welcomed on our campuses. This is how we make change, and change is necessary as we continue our fight for social justice. We will not be silenced. And here's San Diego State Professor of Modern Chinese History, Kate Edgerton Tarpley, speaking at the meeting. I was thus appalled to return to my home university to find that the CSU has imposed draconian new policies that remind me of the rules enforced at Chinese universities, always in the name of public safety and avoiding disorder. Many of the stipulations in the CSU draft policy are sweeping enough to drive a truck through, and they will erode academic freedom and the right to peaceful protest. Certainly, security and safety are important, but the foremost job of universities is to educate and engage our students and give them space to develop their voices on crucial topics of the day. Education is messy and it can be loud and disruptive at times. We must not allow security concerns to turn our campuses into fortresses Amy, you attended this meeting. How did the trustees respond to these comments and criticism? You know, I think that the trustees at Cal State had a really interesting discussion about these interim time, place, and manner policies. And, you know, some of the trustees were sort of saying, you know, we think that there are members of our community, commenters who have come to this meeting, who maybe haven't read the policy and and are seeming to misunderstand it. And at the same time, there were, you know, trustees themselves were pushing for more detail and saying, you know, hey, like, can you also give us more clarity on how this policy would be enforced or how that policy would be enforced? And so there seems to be some recognition that clarity is needed. And what about the criticism from some faculty that you mentioned that they said they didn't feel they had an opportunity for input on the policy? I think that from the perspective of Cal State, they would say, you know, number one, that they they tried to get this interim policy out to various stakeholders and that they've received many, many comments on, you know, the policy that's out there and how it can continue to be refined. They'll also, again, point out that a lot of these policies were already on the books in one way or another and are, you know, simply being compiled in in one place. When I myself, I've called up, you know, some pre speech attorneys or people who sort of specialize in First Amendment law. And when they, you know, read some of these CSU policies, they too raised these arguments that, you know, the plain letter of the law seems really restrictive to them. I think that there's a kind of a hard needle to thread when it comes to um, setting policies that everybody knows what they mean. And from the perspective of, of, you know, whether it's a faculty, a student, a staff member, or again, like these kind of First Amendment experts, I think what they would argue is that if we're not sure what it means, that itself is chilling to free speech. 
Amy, does it seem like the administration is doing a bit of a balancing act here? Yeah, and I think the universities are in a position where they're having to affirm like, yes, of course we are committed to free expression on our campus. And, but then they also have this language that's signaling, you know, hey, but guess what else? Like we're not tolerating, you know, harassment and discrimination within the CSU. They, I think, also recognize that it that they have to have positive practices that help people to talk to each other. And so they've made a long list of what their campuses are doing to train facilitators or, um, you know, create kind of public forums where people can debate. And so I think that they're trying to channel some of these passions for free speech into venues that, from the perspective of the university leaders, are less disruptive. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, happy to help. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Education Beat, Getting to the Heart of California Schools, a production of EdSource. You can find links to Amy and Michael's stories on protest responses and restrictions in our podcast notes and at edsource.org. Our producer is Kobe McDonald. Special thanks to our guest, reporter Amy DePiro, and to our managing editor, Adam Eisenberg. Our theme music is from Blue Dot Sessions. This episode was brought to you by the Stupski Foundation. I'm Zadie Stavely. Join us next week and subscribe so you won't miss an episode.